Okay, welcome to the fourth lecture on abortion. Uh, we've covered the standard abortion debate and Marianne Warren's and Judith Jarvis Thompson's pro-choice arguments. Now we're looking at Patrick Lee's pro-life argument. Okay, so in his paper, the pro-life argument from substantial identity, he gives the following argument. Number one, you and I are intrinsically valuable in the sense that makes us subjects of rights. Number two, we are intrinsically valuable because of what we are, that is what we are essentially. Three, what we are is each a human physical organism. Four, human physical organisms come to be at conception. A biological, this is a biological proposition that a new and distinct human organism is generated by the fusion of a sperm and an egg. Five, therefore, what is intrinsically valuable as a subject of rights comes to be at conception. So then he says, what makes it wrong to kill you or me now would also have been present in the killing of you or me when we existed at adolescent, as adolescents, toddlers, infants, and fetuses. So let's defend the premises. Uh, well, let's look at number one. You and I are intrinsically valuable. It's pretty straightforward, pretty um, self-evident. Two, we are intrinsically valuable because of what we are, essentially. So... We are valuable and it's because of what we are essentially not something accidental to us, like our hair color, our height, um, our um, size, that sort of thing. Um, so we are also not um, valuable because of some instrumental good, like what we can bring about, or some, some um, good state of affairs that we can bring about into the world. No, it's because of what we are intrinsically, and that is that we are uh, human physical organisms, namely human beings or persons, as we'll see later on. Three, what we are is each a human physical organism. We're living bodily entities. That is, that's what we are. We're not consciousness. Uh, we're not a consciousness or conscious entities that inhabit biological organisms. So I am 5'10", but my consciousness is not. Uh, and this is a little more controversial of a, of a premise. Um, it doesn't deny that we have a soul. It, he thinks that the biological organism that we are is ensouled. Uh, he just denies that we're sort of a ghost in a machine. He thinks that we are this body and this body has matter and um, it has a immaterial part and an immaterial part. Premise four, human physical organisms come to be a conception. So embryology tells us this. It's not really uh, controversial here. Now, it, it would appear to be controversial to those who don't know any better, but when you read the embryology textbooks, um, it's pretty clear that the uh, the fetus or, uh, yeah, the fetus is a human being from conception. Okay, so three relevant points about the embryo. Um, first, it is from the start distinct from any cell of its mother or of its father. This is clear because it is growing in its own distinct direction and its growth is internally directed to its own survival and maturation. It is dependent on the mother, but it's distinct from the mother and it's distinct from the father. And it, it is self, has a sort of self-directed um, growth rather than directed by the mother. Second, the embryo is human. It has a genetic makeup characteristic of human beings. So it's an organism from conception. It's a human organism, therefore it's the human being. Third, and most importantly, the embryo is a complete or whole organism, though immature. The human embryo from conception onward is fully programmed actively to develop himself or herself to the mature stage of a human being, and unless prevented by disease or violence, will actually do so, despite possibly significant variation in environment in the mother's womb. None of these changes that occur to the embryo after fertilization for as long as he or she survives generates a new direction of growth. Rather, all of the changes, for example, those involving nutrition and environment, either facilitate or retard the internally directed growth of this persisting individual. Basically, they're just saying there's a whole or human organism, even if it's immature from conception, and that's what you and I are. Okay, so responding to Lee. So let's take a look back at his argument again. Um, we're valuable, and that's because what we are essentially and what we are is human physical organisms. Human physical organisms come to be at conception. Therefore, the very thing that is intrinsically valuable comes to be at conception. So what makes it wrong to kill you or me now makes it wrong to kill you or me when we were fetuses or embryos. So let's respond to Lee. Um, 
objection to premise three, what we are is each a human physical organism. The objection says we're not organisms, we're persons who inhabit organisms. And this goes back to the Marianne Warren distinction between organisms and persons. Persons have certain psychological properties that organisms do not. And since the organism precedes the person, we are, and we are the person, we're not the organism. Now, that has some weird implications. Number one being that for an adult human being, wherever there's the person inhabiting an organism, there's also the organism. So there are two entities wherever we thought there was just one, namely me. Um, so there's a person, there's an organism, and we want to know how they relate. Um, so it is kind of strange, you know, and who's thinking my thoughts? Is it the person or is it the organism? If the organism thinks and I think and I'm a person, why doesn't the organism count as a person? Uh, so, so there are a lot of sort of complications there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, the way to respond to premise three is to argue that we're not human organisms, but we're sort of like consciousness, conscious entities that inhabit organisms. Okay, so premise four, human physical organisms come to be a conception. This is true. No one's denying that in the philosophical literature. It's just at the popular level that people deny that. But the claim is persons do not come to be a conception. Persons come to be when the psychological capacities are present. Okay, how would Lee respond? He would identify the human being with the person. He says the same thing that walks and breathes is the same thing that thinks and acts. He would also make a distinction between ultimate capacities and immediately exercisable capacities and the exercise of a capacity. So what is the exercise of a capacity? Well, I have the capacity to speak English and I'm exercising it right now. That's exercising a capacity. What is immediately exercisable capacity? When I'm sleeping and I'm not speaking English, I have the capacity to speak English, although I'm not exercising it at the moment, but it's immediately exercisable. If my wife woke me up, uh, I could say, hey, what's going on? So I could exercise that capacity. But then there's the ultimate capacity and a person or a thing has an ultimate capacity in virtue of the kind of thing that it is. So a baby cannot speak English, but it has the ultimate capacity to speak English in virtue of the kind of thing that it is. And infants or fetuses are not, um, uh, are the sort of thing that are um, uh, rational kind of kinds of beings and dogs are not. So the, the infant has the capacity to speak English, the ultimate capacity, whereas the dog does not. Give a dog the best education, uh, send the dog to Harvard, give them the best Alpo, give the dog the best Alpo, it's never gonna learn to speak English because it's not the, it's not a member of a natural kind whose members uh, and develop those sorts of capacities, but the fetus is. It's a member of a natural kind, a biological species whose members, if not prevented by some extrinsic cause, in due course develop the immediately exercisable capacity for such mental functions like rationality, self-awareness. So what, what uh, Lee is doing here is he's saying that in order to be a person, you don't have to have the immediately exercisable capacity for higher order thought or a higher order psychological capacities. You just need to have the ultimate capacity and that you have by being a member of a natural kind, namely like being human. Um, and so you're persons from conception because you're a member of a natural kind whose adult members have those abilities and you will in due course develop those abilities, um, whereas the dog will not. And so the dog is not a person. So that's Patrick Lee's argument. He's claiming that we're valuable because of what we are essentially and what we are essentially begins at conception. So when you kill an adult or when you kill a fetus, you're killing something of equal intrinsic value. The response is just to say the fetus is a human being, but not a person. That's just Marianne Warren's case. And we saw that leads to infanticide where it's difficult for the proponent of that view to get around the permissibility of infanticide, whereas on Patrick Lee's view, you're a person from conception because you're a member of a kind who can develop personal capacities. And uh, so then you don't have, you can't immediately exercise those capacities when you're in utero, but you have the ultimate capacities for those things. Given the proper nutrients and environment, you will develop those capacities. 
Okay, so that's the first pro-life argument, and this is a pretty standard argument, although, you know, the way it's laid out would be slightly different from, you know, some other pro-life uh, philosopher. So next we'll look at John Marquis, an argument why, an argument that abortion is wrong.